Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I want to talk about uh, bebop lines and sounding like you're playing jazz. And to put that in context, I have a question that somebody had asked me on Facebook regarding one of uh, the previous videos. So let me read that off for you. This is from Mike and he said, Hello, I came across one of your videos on YouTube and found it really helpful. It was the one with contrasting blues and bebop lines. I wonder if you could describe some of the ways that you've created the bebop lines. I've been practicing arpeggios and trying to nail chord tones while staying in one position, but my lines still don't sound like jazz. So thank you for the question, Mike. Uh, in reply, here's a video. Figured other people can benefit from this as well. So the first thing about this is um, the idea of practicing techniques versus actually playing jazz. And I think that approaching chord tones from an exercise standpoint is excellent. And we kind of have to do that both to train our ear to hear those chord tones and to be able to implement it into our playing. However, that kind of practice misses something when we get to specifically jazz and that's vocabulary. So one thing that has to happen is a lot of listening and a lot of listening to the style that you want to play. So we could address chord tones on rock and it's still gonna sound like rock. We could address chord tones on blues and it's gonna sound like blues. And of course we can do it in jazz and it will sound like jazz. And that's because of the vocabulary that surrounds the chord tones and informs your choices about how you arrive at them. Uh, so I'm just gonna, th there's a lot of ways you can do this, you know, just to sum up one 10, 15 minute about how to make it sound like you're playing jazz would be pretty lofty and not possible to cover everything, but I want to give you some ideas based on the exercise that you're describing. So listening, of course, is just key. Uh, jazz is an oral tradition. You know, we use our ears to learn it and that's changed over the years. You know, jazz education started in the late seventies and it has become a lot more academic, but when you read stories about, uh, you know, the famous jazz heroes, you know, you hear about them wearing out records and, uh, you know, repeating a record so much that the needle would wear into the vinyl uh, because they were repeating it so often to learn how to play the, the solos that they were learning. Um, one story with Wes Montgomery is that he started by learning all of Charlie Christian's solos that he could find, learning them note for note, and then he, would, he actually got hired to play them uh, out and he was just playing Charlie Christian solos. One critique I hear of this is, well, if I just learn somebody else's solos, then I'm just gonna sound like them and uh, I won't have my own ideas. And I think this is uh, probably going to happen at some point in the beginning. You know, if you're just learning somebody's solos, then you're gonna sound like them, but eventually it turns into your own vocabulary. And I think it's really important and something that's not emphasize sometimes in modern jazz education that we still have to do this to make it sound like we're playing jazz. You can learn out of a book how to play jazz. Um, you know, a lot of jazz books have musical examples that you can learn, but really listening is, is just a huge part, I think, for jazz musicians. And even, you know, apart from the instrument, not just transcribing it, just listening a lot and being surrounded by, you know, bebop, for example, you're gonna get that in your ear and when the music stops, you know, you can still hear it in your head. Um, and when you're playing, that will inform your note choices as well. So let's, let's kind of get to some possibilities here. And I'm going to start, we're just going to do this over a slow blues, since the question was regarding the blues, uh, blues lines, bebop lines thing over a blues. And uh, I'll do it in B flat. And I'm going to start by just playing arpeggios as much as possible with no upper extensions. So just root. Uh, third, fifth, and seventh, depending on what the chord is, flat seventh or flat third if it's minor, uh, minor seventh, just flat seventh if it's dominant seventh, and so on. And we're going to use just the basic jazz blues progression right now, which is uh, actually for all of this example, we're just going to use the basic jazz blues progression. And I'm going to uh, make that one, four, one, one for the first four bars. It could be all the one chord, but I, I do want to add that one extra four chord there. So one, four, one, one, first four bars. If you want to jot this down, you probably already know this though. Four, 
four, one, one, four bars five through eight, and two, five, one, five, four bars nine through 12. So all together again, uh, let me give it to you in B flat as well, since we're doing it in B flat. We'll have B flat, they're all dominant chords unless I say otherwise. B flat, E flat, B flat, B flat, E flat, E flat, B flat, B flat, C minor seven, F seven, B flat, F seven. So the only not dominant seventh chord in the whole thing is the C minor seven. So let's start nice and slow, just using arpeggios. One, two, three, four. on that E flat chord by accident. So there's two choruses. Now how can we take the, I, I think personally, just the rhythm and note choice of arpeggios, you can still make that sound like jazz. That's not the way I would normally play two choruses of a blues, but I think that would technically classify as jazz. I know I added a couple notes outside of just the basic arpeggios there as well. I think uh, two, maybe three times. I, it's hard. It's hard to restrict down to that. Um, so now let's start adding some things in. I, I'm not going to play the same thing every time because this isn't pre-planned, but I'm going to do something similar because again, I'm just using the arpeggios for those two choruses. So this next one, I'll also be using arpeggios, but with some different notes and I'll stop as I add them in. One, two, three, four. So first thing, chromatic approaches, and we can do something else too. Uh, so one, two, three, four. So this is uh, where we're surrounding a note and you can surround it diatonically or chromatically and this time it's chromatic. So my target is the third of B flat. So I'm going up one from B from, from the target note. It's the note D, the third here. Uh, a half step above D, a half step below D, and then D. Uh, the first time, I had just slid into it instead and used it as a grace note. Now, the next one, let me do it one more time. Three, four. There's a big note that you can add to these arpeggios, and I don't know if you caught which one I used here. So... It's the ninth, and this is a really good way to extend your arpeggios and start having more of a jazz vocabulary sound. Now, let me take a brief moment here that this is not going to help you play jazz by itself. This will help uh, help you hear some different things when you're listening to a soloist. You'll start hearing these things as you practice them and say, oh yeah, he's adding in the ninth there. Um, not just on a blues form either, uh, in all sorts of jazz tunes, we hear this ninth added. And all the all these things will be things that you hear. So um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that before we go on. So what I did there instead of uh, is so. Um, that ninth. Now I'm going to add in on more chords than just uh, just the four chord. Let me do it, try to do it on every chord. One, two, three, four. Ninth. Ninth. 
that's the ninth there. Ninth. Ninth. Ninth of F. Ninth on top. So that one, now I'm adding uh, the 13th into the chord, or the 6th, but because it's dominant, we're calling it the 13th. So the goal here is that you're adding kind of upper extensions more and more with your arpeggios uh, to get your ear used to the way they sound, and also to extend your arpeggios up past the root. So just let's go back to B flat for a second, right? That's jazz appropriate, I would say. But the phrase really ends there, right? It, it doesn't have to, but our ears really hear. That's like a, a resolution, right? It really sounds like it's done. Now, instead of that, that could be a resolution, but it's not as strong of a resolution. And now it could go. So so just by ending on a note that's not a uh, chord tone that exists as a root third, fifth, or seventh and extending it upwards, it feels like the line wants to continue now. Now the next thing to add to that, and this is in no particular order, I'm just like building a solo here on video to try to give some guidance about some ideas of how to sound more like jazz. Um, the next thing that seems kind of natural there, right? Is chromaticism. And this is where we start getting into like the bebop line idea. Chromaticism is a key element of bebop. Uh, prior to that in the swing period and before that earlier jazz, uh, we, there was not as much chromaticism. There was chromaticism, but not the same uh, amount of it, or sometimes not the same treatment of it either. So as we are leading from one note to another in a scale, or one chord tone to another, we can link them chromatically or surround them like we talked about first. Um, so let's see. Let, let's start the solo a little bit differently. One, two, three, four. That's uh, surrounding the note there. And the other one I was doing before was leading up to the seventh. It doesn't have to be the seventh. How about what if we want to lead up to the fifth? Uh, so one, two, three, four. Uh, we hear this all the time. It doesn't have to be a triplet. I'm using it as a triplet there. One, two, three, triplet. One and two and three. Um, just briefly, let me go to another solo real quick to, to demonstrate something about this. Um, it's one a solo I love, one of my favorite solos by Grant Green. It's on uh, the Sonny Clark Sessions album. It's a Blue Note record. And uh, it's on The Song Is You. Wait, is it? Yeah, The Song Is You. Uh, So he takes this solo break after the head, and uh, it has this chromatic bit here. So the chromatic thing that we're seeing here exists within the distance of a minor third. So let's just go briefly to C major. Uh, so one, six, two, five, one um, is what he's implying over this solo break. and over the minor third, a minor third on guitar, just in case you don't know, can be found if you put down one finger per fret, then your outer fingers are uh, creating a minor third. It's like the middle of uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow uses that. There's a lot of songs that you'll hear minor thirds in. Also, 
So minor third is a very recognizable interval. Um, so your target note can be leading up uh, by half steps within the minor third or leading down. But it's a great uh, phrase and it doesn't have to be a triplet. In this solo break that I'm gonna play, uh, he uses the triplet idea. He uses eighth notes and he uses quarter notes. So let me play it uh, slowly so we can see what's going on. Let's see, if we, so if we have like, one, two, three. So one, two, three. So we have the triplet, triplet, eighth, 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 quarter, 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 quarter. That one, even though it's not here, it's still within the minor third, connecting chord tones. Let's talk about how he's connecting the chord tones. I'll have to play it slowly to do the chords with this. Right, C major seven. He's onto the A chord already. Did I miss one? Sorry. Oh, I missed one. I'm sorry. One more time. So he's connecting of the uh, A7. It's an A7 alt, A7 flat 9. So. There's the seventh in the melody, and he goes down chromatically to reach the fifth of the A7 chord. This is over D minor seven. So, back a half step, back a half step, to lead to the third of the five chord. So he's taking the root of the two chord, D minor, back a half step, back a half step, to lead to the third of the five chord. So now, I, it, I should mention here, this is not what's consciously going through an improviser's mind. Like now I'm going to chromatically lead the distance of a minor third from the root of the two chord to the third of the five chord. Of course not, that's, that's absurd to think that uh, even if somebody could think that quickly about what they're doing that they would choose to rather than just to play with their hearing in their head. Um, so the purpose of this analysis is to see what's going on start taking pieces of it to your own playing and incorporate it uh, in such a way that as you work on it, you're gonna hear other people using these devices and then you'll start recognizing them. The same way how like if you learn a new word, right? Uh, I can't think of the last word I learned. I wish I learned a new word recently. Um, but you know, let's say I learned a new word. I'm not gonna start using it every day while I'm talking probably, unless I'm trying really hard and then people are gonna be like, why does he keep saying that word? Uh, that doesn't sound natural. And that's the same with jazz too. We learn something, we kind of like force it. It doesn't really work. Um, but eventually it does and it becomes within our vocabulary and we can use it naturally. And it's same thing with music. Language and music has a lot of, uh, a lot of things that are connected between them. So, all right, there's one more thing I want to go over. Let's go back to the blues, back to B flat blues. <laughs> So that was a chorus of blues. I, I wasn't planning that. I was just choosing some substitutions. And this is another thing you can incorporate by using your arpeggios while you're practicing, like uh, Mike said that he was doing, and like how a lot of you are doing as well, I'm assuming. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is taking a standard blues, standard jazz blues, like the one I described before, and inserting changes from a different kind of blues on top of it. Um, that one, I combined a bunch of stuff, so that wasn't any song I can think of off the top of my head. But it had a lot of common things uh, that you'll see in other styles of blues. I um, wish I could remember all of them, but... <laughs> uh, so one I know is uh, on bar, uh, bar 8, going to G7 in this key. So it's a turnaround to 2, because that takes us to the 2 chord. 
Hey, welcome back. I'm really sorry my uh, battery ran out and my camera. I've used my phone before for recording, but I'm trying to use my camera since I have a nice camera and mics and stuff. So it kind of bit me, I guess, for trying to be a little more high tech here. So we left off talking about, I think, unless the battery ran out earlier, adding a G7 in bar eight, taking chords from other forms of blues and putting them into our standard blues using substitutions essentially. So in bar eight, I'm gonna be adding notes from G7. One, two, three, four. So that, well, without the bit at the end, this part specifically is not from the standard blues. Normally there would be still B7, B flat seven happening there. But instead we had, and I'll play it in a different place, this phrase. all part of G7 flat 9 or G7 alt. So eventually, once you get used to those first steps of extending your arpeggios up to the ninth using chromaticism and so on, you can take chords from other blues uh, forms, not blues forms, other blues changes. So like a bird blues would be the probably most complicated version of it since it has so many chords. You could solo over a bird blues while everyone's playing a normal blues. Something's you know, it wouldn't match up perfectly. I wouldn't say maybe it would be the most tasteful, uh, but you could make it tasteful and it would still work. Uh, there's a possibility. But the idea is just that you're expanding the palette that you have available by inserting changes from other uh, blues compositions over the standard blues. So that's all I wanted to throw in there. Uh, I, I almost made it to the end of the video before, I hope, unless it cut off more than I think. So I hope this was useful. If you have any other specific questions, let me know. I know this is a general video. There's no one thing I can suggest on how to sound more like jazz, but at least relating to this question of how to make it sound like your lines will play jazz using the exercise of uh, arpeggios and addressing chord tones. I think that this is a good place to start. So I'm gonna get this on the computer and see if it all worked and how much I lost previously. If you like this, please uh, subscribe. It's helpful to me uh, to know just that people are getting stuff out of it. I guess now that we know that uh, Facebook, that uh, you can message me on Facebook, even if we're not like Facebook friends, uh, feel free to reach out there if you'd like. And uh, comments always work as well. Although those get worse, uh, those get lost in my notifications sometimes, but I still see them eventually. Uh, so have a great day, uh, happy practicing and I will see you all next time. Take care, bye-bye.